Hey, my name is Casey from Bitwarden, and you're listening to Firewalls Don't Stop Dragons. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Firewalls Don't Stop Dragons. I'm your host, Carrie Parker. Today, we have episode 316 for March 20th, 2023. And we've got an interview for you today uh, with Casey Babcock from Bitwarden. And with all the stuff that's been going down with LastPass... Uh, I, I reached out to, uh, to Bitwarden to see if I could find somebody to come on the show and talk to us a little bit about not just Bitwarden, though we will definitely be talking about Bitwarden, but about password managers in general and how you can find one that you can really trust. And how do you even trust a system where all your passwords are in one digital basket? And you know, especially after the last pass breach, we also talk about passwordless and pass keys, some, some newer technologies, pass keys in particular what that's about, how that's going to work, and when we can expect to see that, and much, much more. A couple quick notes before we start. If you are running Microsoft Windows, there were some big patches released last week. You should definitely make sure that you're updated. Really, of course, just make sure that you've set automatic updates on your on your on all your computers and all your devices. But if for some reason you haven't done that, or there's some reason that you don't want to automatically do that, this is the time to update your Windows machines because Patch Tuesday just happened and there's some really big fixes in there. So make sure you get your Windows devices updated. Also, before we get into the interview, one term we throw around a little bit but didn't really define is a brute force attack. And we've talked about these before, but just in case you, uh, as a little reminder, but a brute force attack basically is a, when, the, when the bad guys unleash a computer at you know, a stolen password database or an online account that doesn't have any rate limiting on the number of attempts you can make and just starts guessing passwords until it finds one that works, um, which is kind of the equivalent of, you know, taking a lock and making every possible key that you can to see if you can get one that would open the lock, which obviously takes time, but computers are really, really fast. So the best protection against a brute force attack is to have a really long, strong, unique password. So that's what we mean when we say brute force attack. All right, let's not waste any more time. Let's get to our interview with Casey from Bitwarden. Casey Babcock is the product marketing manager at Bitwarden, and she has many years of experience working at software startups in the cybersecurity and project portfolio management industries, working with product engineering teams to communicate meaningful cybersecurity information and product updates. Welcome to the show, Casey. Thank you. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, well, we've talked a lot about password managers lately on the show, you know, thanks to the LastPass breach. And since then, I mean, I've been a LastPass user and recommender for many, many years. But since then, I've, I've been taking to recommending Bitwarden to my audience. So I'm really happy to have you here on the show. You know, before we get into some of the more technical aspects of passwords and authentication, uh, I want to address a more fundamental issue, <laughs> honestly, the most important one, and that's trust. You know, why should people entrust all their passwords, credit card numbers, and other private information with any company or service, you know, particularly given the frequency of software bugs and data breaches? Yeah, that's a really great question. And I think backing up, I think the real question isn't why they should, but rather how to store all that information safely and securely, right? Because I think when you think about it, the reality of the matter is, is that all that information exists, right? All the your credit card information, all your passwords, social security numbers, that all kind of exists in the world. And everyone needs to figure out a way to store that securely that makes sense for them. And I think a lot of people here kind of make, you know, poor choices in the face of convenience. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So for example, maybe like storing passwords in a locked physical vault, but then maybe reusing those passwords across accounts because it's not very accessible that obviously wouldn't be very secure. So the Bitwarden Password Manager essentially helps people store their passwords and other sensitive information in an end-to-end encrypted vault that is much more convenient to access. And I think that's really the main point here. I completely understand why a lot of people are really interested in how they can store their data safely in a cloud service. And that's why Bitwarden is so proud to offer end-to-end encryption for everything in your vault. When we say everything, we do actually mean everything. I think that's an important point there. So no one can access that unencrypted information unless they have your master password, which decrypts the vault. You can add additional security measures on top of that as well. And we actually do recommend that for multi-factor authentication on your vault or other accounts. So it adds even more security to your sensitive information. I also want to add that I think software should be 
battle hardened, if you will, mm. right? Because Bitwarden is open source, it benefits from just a lot of security enthusiasts around the world who are constantly examining our code. And we complete annual third-party audits um, with external security firms. So that also kind of adds to the general security of Bitwarden. Well, and I, I think a lot of people also just kind of get this notion of, you know, putting all their digital eggs in one basket. And and, and the mm -hmm. argument, that, you know, they're worried that they're collecting it all in one nice, pretty package you know, for someone to delete, which became an issue with the last pass breach. Let's face it. People went to the trouble of putting all that stuff in there all of a sudden had all of that potentially at risk. But, it, you know, the, what I like to tell people, and I'm curious if you've got an opinion on this, is when you, if you're looking at the trade-offs, and it's always about trade-offs, if you're looking at the security trade-offs with this, if your other option is, and you kind of alluded to this, if my other option is, well, I want to keep them all, all in my brain, then that means that I either have to be like, you know, a Rain Man type of scenario where I can remember crazy long passwords, you know, verbatim, or I have to start reusing passwords or come up with some system of passwords, which is inherently less secure. And so the argument I try to make is that those are if those are your choices you're better off having long strong unique passes for all your sites stored in a secure vault with people that are really smart that secure it than you trying to manage it yourself absolutely yeah i mean yeah absolutely i think you hit the nail on the head there bitwarden like i said is completely end-to-end -end encrypted so it's incredibly like basically impossible to access any of that and unencrypted information. I had a colleague this morning do a really amazing talk on just kind of our encryption framework and how that essentially works, right? And so with Bitwarden, you have your email address and your pass, uh, master password that basically gets encrypted with Hold on, I have the, it's PBKDF2SHA256, you know, bit encryption, right? Yeah. And so that's done, I think, 600,000 times, mm. right? And then that derives your master key. But then that key accesses another kind of encrypted container that has another key that decrypts your vault. So that is Definitely. It's incredibly safe, incredibly secure. But I, I do understand your point about people thinking that they can just keep it in their heads. And that honestly, like our memory is not perfect, yeah. right? No one's memory is perfect. And so if you're trying to use strong passwords that can protect you against um, brute force hacking, then you're not going to be able to remember those. And you're honestly just going to end up becoming your own worst enemy, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> Right, and I'll tip a little something here. Uh, you guys just announced the start that you're starting to roll out Argon two uh, to mm -hmm. replace PBK DF two, which <laughs> does not roll off the tongue. It is hard to say. Yeah, um, because I mean the fact that you need to do PBK DF two six hundred thousand times, you know, should start <laughs> should start telling us maybe we need something better. And Argon two is that better thing. And you guys just announced, mm -hmm. I think, that you're starting to roll that out, which is great. I do want to kind of hit. Like note that I, it is great that we're rolling that out, but we're. I wouldn't say that it's better, right? I think that it attacks different kind of brute force um, attacks, right? Mm -hmm. So Argon Two is really designed for like a GPU attacks, right? So it fills up the memory of a graphics card that helps slow down a specific attack, but it's not necessarily better than PB that whole string yes. of um, <laughs> encryption is not necessarily better. And it's actually um, recommended by a lot of security experts to use that kind of encryption. So when we added Argon2, it's more for um, just an additional option. I know that a lot of people in our community really love that style of encryption and we're really asking for it. We work very closely with our community. So that was something we definitely wanted to add, but it's not necessarily better. And I wouldn't say anyone needs to rush over to their Bitware and account and change to Argon2. That's not the recommendation here. <laughs> Uh, okay, so the other issue with trust is, you know, as regular everyday non-technical people, which is, you know, 99% of the planet, how are we supposed to evaluate the relative security of all these services? I mean, there's there's a lot of password managers out there, like a ton. You know, not only are there the, the companies like yourself that are kind of dedicated to that, but there are a lot of companies like, how do your browsers do it, right? Browsers have what, you know, built-in password safes that, that you can use. And a lot of the you know, operating systems have their own version of these things. And, you know, they all, they all have all this marketing speak, right? They all have quote unquote military grade encryption or, you know, zero knowledge architecture. And, you know, there's, there's all these buzzwordy kind of things that all sound good, 
But, you know, as a consumer reading that, a regular consumer, how do I parse through all that and figure out which of these services I can really trust? Yeah, absolutely. And I understand why that might seem like a lot of jargon for folks. I do want to clarify that those terms aren't marketing buzzwords. Um, <laughs> but they're unquote. used that way, you... right? They're used that way. <laughs> It, it might it might feel that way, but I promise that they're backed by real industry and security standards. Mm. Um, and I would love to break that down for you mm, yeah. um, here, if that's possible. Oh, please. So when we talk about that military grade encryption that you just hinted at, we're really talking about end to end encryption, which I think I just kind of touched on earlier. So that's where a piece of data, right, is encrypted at one endpoint and then um, decrypted at another endpoint. So it prevents third parties from accessing that string of data while it's being transmitted. So, for example, um, Bitwarden uses a couple different types of encryption for your vault, right? I just talked about the PBKDF2, which is used to derive your encryption key, but then we also use AES CBC for your vault. So that's all kind of derived using a combination of your email address and password. And like I said, your email address and password, it gets fed into this cryptographic function 600,000 times, and then you have that encryption key that is used to decrypt your vault. And that decryption of your vault happens like right on the Bitwarden client and never leaves your device. So I hope that kind of explained that a little bit. And I might add in the event that someone did access your vault data, those encryption steps make it incredibly difficult for hackers to actually brute force your account, especially if you have a strong and unique master password. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really mm -hmm. big key here. In terms of that zero knowledge architecture that you just mentioned, that essentially means that based on the way that the Bitwarden solution is designed and how encryption is implemented, Bitwarden has no knowledge of what information is in your vault, and we cannot see that information. Um, I think that's really important to distinguish here. And I mean, that's partially because your vault is not decrypted within the Bitwarden cloud, right? It's decrypted right on your device. So I hope that clarified some of those buzzwords, as you say, um, for you. Well, I'm not necessarily saying that those aren't real terms or that they don't yeah. have real meaning. What I'm saying is that a lot of companies will throw those around and I, I think some of them don't know what they mean or haven't, even if they do know what they mean, how is a user reading those supposed to know that they did them right? For example, when the pandemic hit and Zoom was already a company, but no, they became a hugely popular company when all of a sudden people had to start taking meetings at home and they claimed that they had end-to-end -end encryption. They said it, that was part of their marketing, but they didn't. I mean, so even though they use the right term, they used a term that's supposed to have meaning, they still failed to to actually have what they said they had. So again, as a consumer, look, they said they had end-to-end -end encryption, but someone else figured out that they actually didn't. So what, as a consumer, how do I know that they're even, that A, that they know what they're talking about, B, that they're actually doing what they say they're doing, and that there, are, there aren't bugs with it that make it irrelevant? <laughs> I, I, maybe yeah. there's no answer to this. I'm just saying that, you know, from like, if I'm explaining this to my mother or my neighbor or somebody at a party... How do I tell them how to figure this out for themselves when they're reading A, product A, and product B, that which one's actually better? Yeah. I think one way to really distinguish this is what companies are transparent with their users and which companies are open source. So as I think I've mentioned before, or maybe I have not, Bitwarden <laughs> is open source and we think it's incredibly important whenever it comes to the security in our privacy of our users, right? So for those who might not be aware with the term open source, it's essentially where our code is published, um, our source code is published um, and is available for review by anyone in the world, right? Mm -hmm. Anyone in the world can hop onto GitHub and look at the Bitwarden code in full. And I think that code transparency really maximizes the number of, individual, of individuals who review the code. And that allows us to really quickly identify potential issues that might come up. And I think to answer your question, you know, how, how do we know that, you know, companies are saying what, what they're saying is true about their product. Mm -hmm. And with Bitwarden and open source products, people can just go in and check, right? Like security enthusiasts or software enthusiasts can go in and confirm those claims that we make. And so if we weren't being accurate in how we position our product, people would know. And I think that's a really key thing here. Yeah, right. So let me flip that on its head and go con conversely. Yeah. And this is something I've said, I'm curious to get your take on this, is I think that when it comes to security and privacy in particular, 
I, I realize that companies are private. They've got shareholders that they've got to answer to. They need to make profits. They need to make money. And so giving away their intellectual property, a lot of them are going to be very reluctant to do so, uh, you know, giving away their source code. And yet I think when it comes to security and privacy, I don't think, I, I'm not sure how I could really trust a company fully unless their code was made public. And a lot of, co like one password is often, cited as one of the best password managers by even security experts and yet their code is not open source and that that honestly was the the deciding factor for me in in recommending bitwarden to most people over one password so is it possible today to really walk the walk and talk the talk if if you don't have open source software when it comes to security and privacy in particular i completely agree i don't think you can honestly i think open source security is really all about trust Right. So if we want to build trust with our user base, build trust with potential new users, the only way to do that is by being completely transparent in our code, how our software operates, and then also just like how our business operates. I think we've been very transparent about that and ultimately giving community members like power to review the source code themselves and then also make contributions. We are, you know, adding in contributions from our community members all of the time um, and they've you know added a lot of really great features and ideas to the product so this is definitely something that is built from the community as well and to kind of go back to that question so whenever it comes to open source and security for software that is not open source how do you really know that they're secure you don't you yeah. you have to kind of base your judgments based on what what is communicated to you but you don't really know Right. And of course, the problem with that, of course, is just because the code is made available doesn't guarantee that it will be inspected. I mean, there's, for example, there's Linux's open source and there's there have been bugs, horrible, horrible bugs found in the Linux kernel that have existed for years. So uh, <laughs> so the, the fact that it's open source doesn't mean that it will be inspected. That 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 alone doesn't guarantee that it's uh, that it's going to be done. But uh, that, you know, there are situations where you can directly employ, you know, third party audits uh, in that case. So have you commissioned third party independent audits of your code uh, to make sure that there are eyes on that? Not just it's one thing to make it available. It's another thing to actually point somebody at and say, please look for errors. You know, ha have you done that? And if so, what 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 did you find? Yeah, absolutely. I think security audits, um, external security audits, right, conducted by third party security firms has always been a very big part of Bitwarden and, you know, ensuring our security that way. Um, we complete annual third party security audits that include penetration testing and source code kind of auditing that we do with external security firms. So we've engaged with Cure 53 and Insight Risk Consulting to conduct these um, annual security audits. So they happen once a year at least, um, and they work probably how you'd expect, right? So we'll engage with security firms and then have them conduct penetration testing across the Bitwarden IPs, um, servers, web applications, or audit the source code. So really covering all aspects of the product and service. And then the firm will prepare a security uh, report that's published on our site and help center. So if you ever want to check out anything that we've um, identified in our audits and resolved, you can go to bitwarden.com compliance, and it has all of our annual security audits there. And being open source, it really enables us to, you know, engage with these um, security firms more often because our code is already open. And then in addition to those annual security audits, we also partner with um, HackerOne um, in a public bug bounty program that's consistently ongoing. So that's kind of in addition to those annual audits. Um, so lots of ways that we maintain strong security at Bitwarden. So just for the audience benefit, we've talked about this a little bit, but I would just make sure that we understand what is, what is pen testing? What is penetration testing when you say that? What does that mean? Yeah, so that's like simulated basically attacks on the Bitwarden infrastructure. So I people might have heard the term white hat hackers, mm. which is essentially hacking for good, right? They're um, doing these penetration tests for companies to help them build better security um, instead of doing it for malicious intent. So one more thing about the audience, because I, I, again, I, I want to like dig just a little bit deeper. And that is, how, how do these actually work? Like, for example, who, who pays for these audits? These things obviously cost somebody some money. And, you know, there are people take time to do these things. They've got resources to mm -hmm. use. So who pays for these? And then 
you know, just to play kind of devil's advocate, how much control, for example, does the audited company have over the publishing of those results? If I pay someone to do an audit, let's say I don't like the results. Is, is it possible for me? I'm not talking about you specific, specifically, mm -hmm. but if, for example, if I were to pay for a third party company to do an audit and I don't like the results, could I just bury them? How does that work? How, what is the yeah. logistical stuff around that? So... I can't talk to any other companies and their security posture here, right? I think a lot of other companies could be more secure. Bitwarden, we publish the entire audit, right? So warts and all. There's some <laughs> things that are probably a little embarrassing in there, but um, you know, we want to be very transparent with our users and other people who might not even use our product exactly like what's going on and mm -hmm. what these third party auditors have discovered. Um, and then exactly what we did to resolve those potential issues. So we don't just kind of publish that and forget about it. That's something that we actively work to resolve. Some diehard security experts prefer password managers that are local storage only, or maybe self-hosted solutions that allow them to basically have direct control over their vault data. How much do these solutions differ from using a cloud-based service? And, you know, for somebody who's so inclined, you know, what is involved? Like if I thought, well, let me give this a shot. If I had the chance to do this, maybe I'll do it. What is, what is involved in setting up and managing like a hosted type of solution? Yeah. So maybe we should back up for a second and define self-hosting just Please. for the audience. I want to make sure that everyone's on the same page here. So when you're self-hosting a solution, that's on your own machine, right? Um, so you're self-hosting the server, sometimes the database, that's something that you have control over. Whereas a cloud hosted solution that's hosted by a third party in the cloud for you. Now for Bitwarden specifically, um, you can self-host or utilize the Bitwarden cloud. Um, we kind of touched on earlier about how secure the Bitwarden cloud is, but you can absolutely self-host your Bitwarden instance as well. And I think the right choice for you really kind of depends on um, your expertise and preference for managing a self-hosted instance, because it does take some work. It does enable businesses or individual users to really take full control of their password management environment and data. But I think for a typical team or a typical like user, a self-hosted instance would probably be way too much maintenance for them, right? Mm -hmm. It would, they would probably benefit way more from the cloud hosted offering because they can start with just a few clicks and easily access um, all their passwords and other sensitive information. But if you definitely want to go the self-hosted route, um, Bitwarden has quite a few different options um, for that and different deployment options here, right? So you can deploy directly from the Bitwarden site, a Docker Linux containers or a digital ocean droplet, if that's something that would be interesting to you. So the Docker Linux containers would contain that Bitwarden infrastructure. We also just released um, a new uh, self-host deployment that's currently in beta. Um, it's called the Bitwarden Unified Self-Host Deployment. And this is a little bit more streamlined, right? So hmm. for people who definitely want to play around with self-hosting, but might have a preference for something that's a little bit easier to manage, mm -hmm. this is deployed within just one Docker container, right? So you don't have to go messing with multiple um, and trying to get that organized. It's all in one container. So it's a really great streamlined version for um, individuals. I probably wouldn't recommend it for businesses. So lots of options when you're looking to self-host and lots of customization too, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think that's one of the reasons why people like self-hosting is that they can tweak and do things themselves and make their own integrations essentially. Right. I and mean, automations. It, it's like, you know, you could service your own car at home. You could fix your own vehicle. Yeah. If you don't trust taking it to a shop and they're going to tell you that what's really wrong is what's happening. And if you don't trust the parts are going to put in, you can do it yourself. It's just, <laughs> but it's not something the average person honestly has time to do, uh, let alone the expertise to do. And I, to me, I, I think of it kind of the same way. But the other one, I think I th that's a great way to compare it. Honestly, I, I, I love that comparison. I'll probably use that in the future <laughs> if I can steal that from you. <laughs> sure. Uh, so the other thing I touched on, though, is the other the other thing that some people say is like they want to use something like KeePass X or XC or whatever the one is that actually it's purely local. So you mm -hmm. store it into a vault. And that vault never leaves your computer. But that has its own downsides as well, right? Because then if you still want to use it on multiple devices, you still have to somehow synchronize that, which now you're back in the cloud. So mm -hmm. <laughs> what is the use case for somebody who wants to who doesn't trust the cloud service? I guess they're kind of doing their own cloud thing. What What is your take mm -hmm. on local hosting versus a cloud service? Or lo yeah, not local I mean, hosting, you, local vault, like, a, you know, no, you know, you know what I mean? 
Yeah, exactly. Um, and I think you kind of hit the nail on the head, right? So people who are hosting their entire vault locally, that that runs into um, accessibility issues, um, convenience issues. So that's when they start. I, I see it very similar to um, like keeping your passwords in a physical vault, right? They're going to end up reusing passwords. It's not going to be as convenient. And so as people, we just end up taking shortcuts. And so when it comes to um, keeping things in the cloud, you can much more easily use you know, your password manager across devices and much more easily access that information and just go about your life. You know, like you need that information to do anything nowadays. I might add that uh, for Bitwarden, you can self-host and still um, have access to all of our different clients and essentially access your passwords from anywhere and anytime. So that's also a good option for people who um, are looking to host locally. Well, okay. So beyond the, the technical aspects, which we've discussed quite a bit, when, yeah. you're talk, when you're looking at a service, I think it's also important to understand the, the business model and the priorities of the companies to whom we entrust our most sensitive data. So as consumers, again, you know, how are, how are we supposed to figure out which companies have our best interests at heart? Maybe another way to look at that is like, if I'm trying to evaluate, and again, I want to extrapolate a little bit. I know we're talking about Bitwarden and kind of password mm -hmm. managers here, but security and privacy companies in general, if I'm looking at company A versus company B or product A versus product B, what kind of red flags might I see, you know, that might make me think, eh, maybe, you know, they say that they say they're doing these things, but I don't like their business model. I don't, I don't, I don't like what they've done over here that maybe uh, Google, for example, they've already got a pretty bad rep when it comes to privacy. Um, mm -hmm. And so I've seen lots of articles lately about things Google are trying to do and like people are automatically distrusting them out of the gate because of, well, history. So anyway, if, if I'm trying mm -hmm. to evaluate companies, what can I look at? What aspects can I look at about their business model or their business practices or maybe their history that might raise red flags for me in terms of who should I trust and who should, who should not trust? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think this kind of goes back to our open source conversation, but in a kind of a different light. I think it's just transparency, right? If they're being transparent about their business model and their overall mission, I think that that's a green flag for me. Um, once you get into, you know, not necessarily having a mission that benefits the greater good of everyone, I think that's kind of like a red flag that goes up for me, <laughs> um, especially whenever they don't have transparency, right? So one thing that I really love about Bitwarden is that we maintain our business value through paid plans, um, obviously, but um, our main goal, our main overarching vision is to imagine a world where no one gets hacked. And so that's primarily why our free um, our free plans will always remain free and they'll always be a fully featured version for all users, right? I think that's the main way. And so whatever we do, you know, as a business, it will always be to continue towards that vision. All right. Well, it, you touched on a, a, mm -hmm. the, something else I wanted to get into, and that is something yeah. else that I think a lot of people don't, or might not be aware of unless they read the business section all the time, is that, you know, acquisitions and outside investments can have a significant impact on a company's priorities, uh, usually, in my experience, towards maximizing profit. For example, I know you guys, you guys just got a $100 million investment, uh, which is a pretty large investment, uh, certainly for, uh, I think, a, a company of your size. You know, is there is there pressure now to focus on, you know, more lucrative services or enterprise customers? And you touched on this. I mean, LastPass, this is, this is one of the, the second to last straw for me for LastPass was when they got bought out and they removed multi-device support from their free tier. They had it and they took it away, which I think is just a PR disaster. I mean, when you, when you ever remove, you know, functionality from, from something that that's always a bad sign, but they changed because their priorities were changed for them by either outside investment or outside acquisition. So how, how does that play into this? And, and you've, you've already said it, but I'd like you to kind of maybe say it again. You guys have just got a big investment. Yeah. Does that change your change what you're going to do? Does that change your focus? No, it does not change our focus at all. It's exactly what we are working on before. We just now have better funding to go after that, right? Better funding to enable everyone with um, free and, you know, complete security. Like I mentioned, our, you know, business plans, our paid plans, it basically just funds that. And then um, our investment has also helped us, you know, kind of expand that vision, um, being able to go into a couple different areas. So we're currently, you know, exploring other opportunities um, in the, sec the security space, including developer secrets, which will be um, coming out, uh, we'll have a 
Secrets Manager um, in beta coming out in spring of this year. So that's very exciting. Um, and then also password list technologies, right? Um, we were recently able to make an acquisition of passwordlist.dev, which is a really interesting solution that allows developers to easily build pass keys and other biometrics for their own websites uh, with an extensive API framework. And that is possible because of that um, investment that we received. Um, so still completely on the same track, still have that same vision. We're just able to do a lot more. All right. So forgive me for putting you on the spot, but is there a public written commitment to, to maintaining the free tier and the features in the free tier? Is that something that you've posted anywhere? So yes, we actually have this written very public facing. Um, like I've said, we've been very transparent with our users. So if you want to read more about like what we've publicly committed to and like what our business model is, we have an article that's on our um, blog. So you could go to bitwarden.com slash blog and check out the article titled Accelerating Value for Business Users, Bitwarden Raises 100 Million. That is a really great reference just to better understand exactly what our business model is and what we're committed to as a company. Like I said, that vision is just ensuring that no one gets hacked. And I think that this really details this very well. Um, it's written by our CEO, so there's no confusion there. It's coming straight from the top. So, Well, I'm, I'm excited about the secret thing. That's something you and I hadn't talked about prior to this, but I want to dig into just mm -hmm. real quickly that as a software developer, yeah. that was a really tricky thing. I mean, right. You had to, because, you know, especially with all these uh, web APIs and rest APIs, you've got all these token management things and, and other secrets you have to, to set up within your system to do your testing. And there have been several cases where software has, has been published with, with some of the passwords embedded in the code because they hadn't managed their secrets, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's tricky to do. So that's really cool that you guys are doing. Do you want to talk a little bit more about the secrets management thing? Like what, what does that provide for developers? Yeah, absolutely. So um, as I just mentioned, um, it's going to be available as an open beta starting spring of 2023. So then that's going to be free for everyone, right? Everyone can go create a free Bitwarden account and enable Secrets Manager. We really want everyone to be able to test that out and have access to um, security for their developer secrets. Um, so this new solution is essentially designed for securely storing, sharing, and managing developer secrets. And so it's going to be completely end-to-end -end encrypted, still following that open source model and allowing, you know, developers to retrieve and automatically update the secrets that they're working with to reduce that secret sprawl. I think you kind of mentioned as well, like there has been some serious disasters with people hard, co hard mm -hmm. coding secrets into um, code source code that gets released. And that's something that we really want to prevent with Secrets Manager, right? Um, that's, that's a serious uh, issue um, whenever it comes to protecting sensitive company um, information and applications. So that Secrets Manager will enable uh, developers and DevOps, te DevOps teams to better protect their secrets, better secure their secrets, and then prevent them from being reused or hard-coded into any applications. Cool. Yeah, that yeah, those are great tools. We we definitely need better stuff like that. I mean, because there's hackers know this, and hackers have tools that'll scan binaries looking for strings like that and try to you know tease out passwords that were somehow embedded. It's 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 a tricky thing to do. So yeah, we definitely need some more help there. That's great. Yeah, absolutely. And if anyone um, who's listening to this podcast is interested in trying it out, we have a beta waitlist going. Um, so we'll notify you as soon as it's available. And so you can go in and enable it um, immediately. Just check out uh, the Bitwarden forums and we'll have um, the link there to fill that out. Awesome. Thank you. And I'll definitely put, put links yeah. to all the stuff in the show notes. Amazing. All right. So we've talked about passwords and you just mentioned passwordless and that is a big topic lately and it's got a lot of promise. So I want to, I'm going to spend some time digging into that a little bit. So you know, we've talked about passwords and, you know, the need for password managers because, you know, humans are bad at doing this and trying to remember and create long, strong, random passwords is, you know, something that we need a tool for, but better yet would be if something else did that for us entirely, we don't have to worry about it at all. So, you know, after, you know, years of trial and error, and you, you know, we may have finally come up with the quote unquote password killer technology, uh, and it's called password list. Sometimes it's called pass keys. So, what exactly is this technology? What makes it so much better? And one of the big things they claim about it is that it's phishing proof. Is that is that true? 
Yeah, so this is, I know this is a very hot topic right now, mm -hmm. passwordless technologies. And I do want to note that Bitwarden has long championed passwordless technologies. This is nothing new. There's new topics within passwordless mm -hmm. technologies, but the general idea is um, has been around for quite some time. Um, like uh, passwordless authentication with biometrics, using security keys, um, like Yubi keys, SSO integrations, those kinds of things. They've been a Brown for quite a while, and it's something that Bitwarden has always supported. So diving into this a little bit, um, when we talk about passwordless, I think it's really important to distinguish what we mean by pass keys and then what we mean by passwordless here, because mm. those are kind of two different entities that are very related, but they do mean different things. Um, okay. So pass keys are built on FIDO2 WebAuthn technology, right? And they authenticate based on generated keys that are stored in a device specifically or like a cross-device platform. So for example, like in a real life application of this, you uh, might be able to generate a pass key on an iPhone and then um, use it to access other products within the Apple ecosystem. Um, and I think that's something that's actually um, currently available. Mm -hmm. And so there's that idea of pass keys, right? But then pass keys are part of a broader group of passwordless technology, which I mentioned Bitwarden has supported for years. This is nothing new. But that includes like passwordless um, biometric authentication, like face ID, Windows Hello, fingerprint authentication, right? I know I have like Windows Hello set up on my laptop. Um, I think a lot of people probably have something very similar. And that's authenticating based on who you are, right? So instead of a password, you're using something about yourself to authenticate into an application or an account. Next, you can authenticate um, based on what you have, right? Um, so that's another form of passwordless technology where you're using physical security keys like YubiKeys. Think of it kind of like as um, like a key to a vault, right? Like that's something very physical that you can mm -hmm. have. And then lastly, um, another category whenever I think about passwordless technology is authent authenticating based on what you have access to. So that like includes pass keys, but also like SSO integrations or SSO maybe authenticating. SSO being single sign-on? Yes, single sign-on. Thank you for clarifying. But it also can be like authenticating by a particular device that is already logged into a solution. So for example, with Bitwarden, you can log into the web vault um, on like a computer uh, with just a push notification on your mobile phone. So if you're logged into Bitwarden on your mobile phone, you can access the web vault without a password, which I think is pretty darn cool. So that's kind of what the passwordless space looks like. When I was first digging into it, it was honestly a little bit confusing just because <laughs> yes. there's a lot of different terminology being thrown mm -hmm. around. And I think some people are a little confused in terms of um, how pass keys and password lists kind of overlaps. But kind of going back to what you said about being phishing resistant, Passwordless authentication options, they're definitely considered more secure and more resistant to phishing attempts just because they're not something you can really be tricked into handing over. Mm. Like imagine you were on, you got a phone call or an email that's part of a social engineering hack. You can't really be tricked into handing over a pass key or a physical hardware key or let's say your fingerprint. That's not something that is really realistic. So kind of with these um, security characteristics in mind, the Bitwarden team has also been really committed to providing um, passwordless authentication solutions to Bitwarden users, which is uh, why we're so excited about the passwordless.dev acquisition. And I think a lot of the Bitwarden community members are excited about that acquisition as well. Well, I think one of the key distinctions for me about this technology mm -hmm. versus passwords is passwords is a symmetric secret thing. It's like you and I share a secret. I have a password. You remember a hash of that password, actually, not the password itself. But we share we share a secret when we set up the account. And going forward, I prove that I am who I say I am by regurgitating that secret. Whereas with passkeys and passwordless, it's a, a public-private key pair thing, where the only thing that the, the website that has my account has is a public key, which is part of the, a pair of keys. So even if they're hacked, for example, and someone, the bad guys go into target.com or amazon.com or bankofamerica.com and steal the entire password database for all their customers, it's useless because that's all the public mm -hmm. keys. Um, am, I, am I getting that right? Is that is that is one of the major differences between this technology and what we're used to with passwords, correct? Yes, I believe so. Yeah, because... Uh... They, they, they would have that information in terms of like what you're accessing the account or application on, but not necessarily how you authenticated, which might be with a different device. 
Okay. All right. From a user's perspective, how do I set up passkeys or passwordless authentication with an online account? You know, do I do I have my, how do I have my private keys backed up? Do I have to worry about this? Do they synchronize themselves somehow magically? You know, how do I how do I set this up? I go to Amazon.com and either I set up a new account or I want to change my account type of authentication. Like, how does that work? How, as a user, what happens? Yeah, and I think again, it's important to distinguish here, like between passwordless and pass keys. As I mentioned earlier, there's lots of different ways to set up passwordless authentication um, for an online account, right? So we can do that with pass keys, device authentication, biometrics, physical security keys, single sign-on. And we can also use all of those passwordless authentication methods alongside two-factor authentication mm -hmm. or as two-factor authentication, right? So I know some people have like a, a, a master password that they put in somewhere, but then they have to authenticate with a physical security key. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a full form of passwordless authentication. In terms of pass keys specifically, yeah. I think a lot of applications are still not supporting this yet, right? Mm -hmm. So as an end user, you probably won't be setting that up a lot unless you are in a very highly technical space. So, but I, I definitely see this starting to roll out step by step. So like if you go by what's happening in the industry, there's a lot of industry heavyweights like Apple, like Google, Microsoft. They're all backing that move to pass keys. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really safe to say that end users are going to be experiencing that in the future. And ideally, it would be great to have that information synchronized across devices. But um, I think it depends on how pass keys are implemented for each application, right? And if they have a way to store those pass keys. Bitwarden is really excited to have that kind of on our roadmap as a future initiative to um, have pass keys that are synchronized across devices. But that's definitely a future initiative. And I don't think a lot of applications are even ready to support that yet. Yeah, and I, and I think that's the key is it's still rolling out and, and they're still mm -hmm. trying to figure out the most convenient way to do this for users. But I, I, the way I hope that's going to be in the end is, you know, it might be hopefully like a one time setup, like, you know, like a one time account creation. And then, you know, maybe for a, for a new untrusted device or a device I haven't logged in before, maybe I bring out my phone and I scan a QR code, kind of like we do for setting up you know, two factor. Uh, and then after that, it should kind of be under the covers. Like I shouldn't have to worry about it. Like mm -hmm. the passkeys the you know, the, the system should be built into the operating system to just manage that for me. And when I go to log in, there's, there is no more type in your password anymore. It's click here, or maybe, you know, activate with face ID or something. And, mm -hmm. uh, and it just behind the scenes does all that stuff for you. And it should be, should be simpler. And of course the key being again, that now they're creating all these keys for you behind the scenes. They're going to be crazy, long, strong keys. You know, it, it's just like one step more removed from having to deal with passwords, which I cannot wait for that to happen, but you're right. We do. Oh, absolutely. These sites have to support um, it first. Yeah, absolutely. And I've, I've seen like some early demos of, um, you know, password, like pass key authentication like that. And that's exactly what's happening, right? Really easy to set up. You might, um, you know, have that pass key set up with a different device, right? Just to authenticate that you are who you say you are. And then um, it's all happening behind the scenes. So it's not something an end user has to deal with um, in terms of, you know, long and secure passwords. Right. And that's the other kind of the different mm -hmm. flavor of this is it's, it's kind of like, uh, it's kind of almost like authentication by proxy, like you authenticate yourself to your device, and then the device authenticates you to everybody else. And so by authenticating yourself to the device, you've engaged this technology, like on Windows, it's the TPM chip or something on, on Mac, it's a secure enclave. And, and so you've got a some way to get into that. And sometimes it's biometric, sometimes it's pin code it could be a mixture of these things. But at some point you like, all right, I proved to my device who I am. And then from there on out, the device proves to everyone else that they are representing me. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I'm really excited to see how, you know, pass keys kind of rolls out across the industry um, as a standard. And I, I think I've touched on passwordless.dev as an acquisition for us. And that's really going to help enable developers to um, add pass key and passwordless authentication options to their applications. I think there's definitely a big you know, not necessarily a learning curve, but um, some definitely some serious challenges to adding that to current applications and accounts. And so um, with passwordless.dev, we have these extensive API frameworks that is essentially plug and play for developers to um, quickly add these kinds of passwordless authentication onto their applications. So really excited to see, you know, how all of this rolls out, how the industry evolves um, around these pretty new technologies. 
Right, right, right. Yeah, so uh, so it takes two to tango, right? So, so with both, mm-hmm. both, both ends, you know, the client and the server basically at this point need to support this technology before it could be useful. So given mm-hmm. that you have companies like yourself that uh, uh, through acquisitions like passwordless.dev, how long do you, I mean, put on your crystal ball, you know, <laughs> what, how long do you think it's going to take before this becomes more common? Like the, let's say the top 100 websites uh, that require passwords. How long do you th- is it going to be a year? Is it going to be five years? Like how long do you think it's going to take for this to, to really roll out? Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> and I honestly don't know. I'm going to be completely honest here. I don't know. Um, but like I said, there's quite a few big players in the industry who are really backing this move and, you know, Bitward and included. So I would hope soon, but I think there's also a user learning curve here, right? Um, Mm -hmm. I mean, I, it it took me long enough to get my parents to use a password (laughs) manager. I think it's going to take even longer to get them to be using pass keys, but ideally, um, it it just comes down to cybersecurity education, right? Like Mm -hmm. as long as people understand how much more secure they are, I think that's going to really help the uh, adoption once these get rolled out. So I don't know, I, I would say in the near future, absolutely. I don't think I have a due date for you. <laughs> well, it can't happen soon enough because I, from everything I've everything I've seen about it, it's going to be much much more superior in a lot of ways, including convenience, which is rare. Uh, you know, for something to be more secure and more convenient, so that that'll be great. You've touched on this a little bit, but I want to make sure I understand. With pass keys, will that obviate the need for two-factor authentication? Will we still have two-factor authentication? Will it? Will we have it, but it'll work in a different way? And for the few of us that do want to go full tilt and have hardware keys, does it supplant that? Or is it, again, does it work in conjunction with that? How does it play with, these, with, two, with those other kind of second-factor tech? Yeah, I think the way that I've seen passwordless and two-factor authentication currently work is that they work very closely together, right? I think two-factor authentication is a really amazing additional layer of security yeah. that you can add to your accounts. You can add to Bitwarden. You can add to so many different things. Um, and I really think that more people should be using it. So concerning all this, I don't think two-factor authentication is going to go away anytime soon. And I really hope it doesn't. It really shouldn't go away. There's so many different forms of two-factor authentication. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and Bitwarden really recommends that uh, you use that on all of your accounts. But kind of going back to uh, what you said, I can see us using passwords in conjunction, like passwords as your main authentication method, and then password lists authentication as a secondary, Mm -hmm. um, as that two-factor authentication or flip-flop. I think it could go either way. Yeah, Yeah. but I think think using them um, together is definitely something in the future. And is happening today. (laughs) Well, two-factor authentication is such a, it's so good to have that second layer of defense. Uh, You know, I like to say belt and suspenders. And in a lot, but it's very few people. I mean, if if password manager adoption is low, two factor authentication is way lower than that. I, I I think I saw could be this came to light with the Twitter announcement that <laughs> Elon says that you know in order to keep using SMS two factor authentication you have to pay money, but the the, the stats that came with that article were something like two point four percent of Twitter users use two factor authentication. I mean that's abysmally low for something that's really easy to do and adds a huge layer of protection. I don't know what the industry-wide stats are on that, but it's unfortunately two-factor authentication adoption is really low. And as you said, it's such a great security measure. So anyway. Absolutely. Yeah, I was actually just talking about that announcement this morning. And I honestly, it might be a good move for security because um, removing that text two-factor authentication, because it will just move regular users to um, an authenticator app or a hardware key. I think that's a much safer way to authenticate as a secondary method. I get why they're doing it. It just I honestly I just wish they'd just get rid of it. Use this as an excuse to get rid of SMS based two factor all the all together. Mm-hmm. That's that's just weird. All right, all right. So last question before we go. <laughs> so what's 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 next for Bitwarden? You know, what new features? Mm-hmm. Uh, you've talked about a few uh, for the developers, but are there any other maybe consumers uh, end user features like for you and me uh, that we might be looking forward to? What what's on the horizon? Yeah, so um, for people who are interested, I'll I'll run through a couple things, but for users who are interested in the full roadmap, we have that on our community forums and that's updated regularly. So you can always check back and see exactly what the Bitwarden team uh, is working on and what we have on the horizon. But yes, I mentioned the Bitwarden Secrets Manager that's coming out spring 2023. So the Bitwarden team is working uh, pretty hard on that and then the major thing that I think um, is going to be coming out from Bitwarden 
and that is on the roadmap is more passwordless offerings, mm -hmm. right? So we're going to be expanding that passwordless.dev program. We're going to be adding more passwordless logins um, in the first half of the year and passwordless login options in the first half of the year. And then uh, we have pass key support as a future initiative. So um, we don't have a due date for that yet, but um, it's definitely on the roadmap. So lots to come from Bitwarden. We're, um, you know, we're constantly rolling things out every month. So really excited to see how the product evolves. Well, and you just got a big shot in the arm in terms of funding. I mean, so we don't have to worry, for example, as consumers that you guys might be going under anytime soon because you guys, you should have a nice long runway with, uh, with some of that in funding. So uh, anyway, very glad to see that you guys are doing well. And I'm sure you're getting a lot more users with the latest LastPass debacle. So uh, I hope you guys do great. Thank you so much for coming on the show, Casey, and explaining all this stuff to us. Yeah, thank you. I was super excited to be here. <laughs> All right, that's going to wrap it up this week. Thanks again so much to, to Casey for coming on the show. I did want to go back and touch base out on a couple things that we mentioned during the interview that you might not be familiar with. One is this thing called Docker. And Docker is, boy, it's hard to explain in 25 words or less, but it's kind of like a virtual machine, maybe a lightweight virtual machine, but it's a, it's a little container running an instance of an operating system, and it can be various operating systems. Linux is very common. And in the case we're talking about here with self-hosting, it's probably Linux, but you can kind of set up basically a mini, a mini dedicated computer, a little process running on your machine that acts like a little server. And the nice thing about this is you can kind of pre-configure it and it only has the things installed that you want to run. And it's kind of like a dedicated computer for one task, one, one thing you want to have running. And, it, and that might mean that you've got a couple different processes running. You might have a database running and a, and a web server running and things like that. But they're all related things that you want to kind of run together as a little package and nothing else. And you can run this in a little instance of Docker. And we use this a lot of times as a developer for our development environment. We would have a very fixed setup for our compilers and things, and it's really convenient to put all that into a Docker instance that, that somebody can maintain, somebody in the group can maintain and make sure it's got the right versions of everything. And then everybody can reuse that Docker image to run a little copy of that and get the exact correct environment for doing our software development. So it's really kind of a nice way to configure and pre-package a very specific set of Linux libraries and processes and applications all running together for a very specific purpose. And it's not quite as esoteric as it sounds. If you have like a Synology NAS box, which is a network attached storage, like basically a, a file server, a lot of modern file servers that you could buy for your home for personal use have the capability for running Docker images and you can log into a nice little web interface and download them and, and, and run them and get them updated by clicking a button and they just become available on your network. This allows you to run things like Plex or Bitwarden or some of these other services that you can self host. Another way to do that is by hosting things in a virtual server in the cloud. DigitalOcean is a very popular one. I use a service called Linode, L-I-N-O-D-E. There's some, there's another one called Vulture, V-U-L-T-R. There, there are several. And for as little as like five bucks a month, you could rent a little low power Linux server that runs in the cloud that you can access from anywhere on the internet. So these are, these are things, if you want to play around with Linux, these are fun ways to do it. I put links in the show notes to uh, most of the things that Casey talked about, including that blog article and a link to the secrets manager. If you're a developer out there and you're curious about that, you can check those out in the show notes. And then as usual, uh, I kept Casey around for a little bit longer for a little bonus content for my patrons where we, uh, I asked her about some, you know, marketing data on the use of password managers, how many people use them and how they're used. And I also kind of picked her brain a little bit about how she tries to convince people to use password managers, you know, what kind of arguments she makes when, when, when trying to, you know, get people to improve their security. So my patrons will get that bonus content on Thursday as usual. If you want to learn about being a patron and all the perks they're in, go to patreon.com and search for firewalls, don't stop dragons. Or of course you can just go to fdsd.me slash support and you'll find the links and all the info there. The merch store is open. You can get your dragon swag by going to fdsd.me slash merch. And you can send me your dear carry questions at fdsd.me slash QNA. That'll have all the information you need there. 
The fifth edition of the book, of course, is out. It's on Amazon. It's back in stock. And so I'm not sure what the heck happened there. These should be print on demand. Uh, but it is back in stock and no waiting at Amazon.com. If you've read the book, I would love to get reviews. I've only got five so far, and I'd love to get a lot more. It really sucks that I can't carry forward you know, all my five-star reviews from the previous editions of the book, but I can't, so i got to start from scratch. So if you've read the book and like it, I would love for you to post a nice review on Amazon. All right, everybody, that's going to do it this week. Thank you again for tuning in. Next week, we'll have a news show as usual and more great interviews coming down the pike. So subscribe if you haven't. That way you won't miss any of it. Take care, everybody. Stay safe out there. And until next week, as usual, don't get caught with your drawbridge down.